The Nonprofit Development Center of Southern New Jersey presents The Future of Social Media How to Make It Really Work for Your Organization. This program was recorded April 19th, 2011, in Mullica Hill, New Jersey. Appearing on the panel, Rob Harrington, president of MANA Design Works, Steve Lubetkin, managing partner of professionalpodcasts.com. Jen Regina, president of the Marketing of Everything. And Howard Yermish, president of howardyermish.com. Moderating the panel and acting as the master of ceremonies, Michael Wilman, the president of WMSH Marketing Communications and chairman of the Nonprofit Development Council of Southern New Jersey. Now here's Michael Wilman. Morning. My name is Mike Wilman. I have two roles here today. One is to uh, greet you, tell you about <coughs> the host organizations, uh, and do some housekeeping. And then, a little bit later, I have a second role, which is to be witty and charming and to facilitate the discussion, which will take place uh, involving these three folks and this gentleman. So we have a subtitle for today's event. Uh, this is Steve Lebetkin. I'll tell you more about him in a moment. Rob Harrington, Jen Regina, and Howard Yermish. You think that the title of this presentation is The Future of Social Media. It's subtitled, Three, Three Bald Guys and a Babe. <laughs> All right. Hair is overrated. Hair is overrated, uh, Mr. Lebetkin <laughs> says. Uh, since I'm well on my way to joining these, uh, these three computer dudes, uh, I guess I should take that to heart. All right, your host today is the Nonprofit Development Center of Southern New Jersey. I'm going to guess that for most of you, that's not a name that comes uh, tripping off the end of your tongue, probably not even a name that you're uh, other than very passingly familiar with. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about the organization in a moment. What I need you to know is that we are, in effect, the Southern New Jersey affiliate of the Center for Nonprofits, and that is an organization you may know of. So it is statewide. Its goal is capacity building for not-for-profits. Uh, our geographic reach is the eight counties of southern New Jersey, but with the very same goal. So we present programs such as this. We do other things, and along the way, I will sort of impregnate into the day little bits and pieces which will make you say, gosh, i got to be on their mailing list or whatever or whatever. I've already had one person volunteered to be a speaker at a future event. So I knew we were being successful <laughs> when somebody wants to be part of the, uh, of the presenter group. Uh, we have a couple of goals for today. The first is that all of you will walk out the door with at least one real idea of other than passing significance that you will put into play for your organization, whoever has footed the bill for you being here today. That's a serious goal. The other goal is that we want you to talk good about us. So we can do that in a number of ways. We can deliver the substance, and these four folks will certainly do that. Uh, they are a traveling road show. They most recently appeared in Burlington County uh, last Friday, and they got rave reviews. Uh, there's possibility of doing this in a lounge in Atlantic City at some point in the future, but we're not sure whether that will come to pass. Uh, we want you to know each other when you leave, because at every one of our programs, we operate on this assumption that there is somebody in this room, not us, that would be a good partner for you. If you knew what that person or his or her organization does, you would say, we could do this together in a way that would be good for both of us. So we are looking for those symbiotic, not the parasitic, but the symbiotic relationships. To do that, we have to have all of you know who you are. It also makes it better for the people who are presenting to know who you are. So before we do a little bit more housekeeping, we are going to take the time to go around the room and have you say who you are, where you're from, and knowing that I will cut you off unmercifully if you exceed this time limit, within 20 seconds, say what your organization does. Now, you're going to tell me that you can't do that in 20 seconds because you do so many wonderful things that you couldn't begin to scratch the surface. And I would say to you, bullshit, OK? <laughs> you all know what an elevator speech is. You all know that nobody is out there dying to meet you. So that when you do have the opportunity to talk to them, you have to say something that will get their attention and hopefully result in 
them saying, gosh, we should talk some more. Or at the very least, not throwing up on you when you say, gosh, we should talk some more. So this is your chance. So it serves two purposes. It lets everybody else know who you are, as well as the people on the panel. And it is practice. Trust me, none of us have any money. But we're going to tell you how to get money, which is almost as good. OK, I told you we wanted to be valuable for you. Uh, I have no doubt that the substance of it will be, since these guys are all really, really, really smart about what they do. But on the outside chance that you have a more mercenary approach to it being valuable, if you reach under your chair to the right-hand side, where the little chrome or little arm comes down, you may or may not find a $100 bill. You might find a dollar bill. If you find a $100 bill, it's a mistake. So please give it to me. If you found the dollar, raise your hand. There's a lot more than that. Come on, you got to look. It's on the right-hand side, right above the little... Oh, more money. Now you got the people on the panel looking up here. On the... All right. So for some of you, yeah, don't rip the label off. People come and cart you away. It's illegal. All right. Next thing, introduce you to the members of the board of the Nonprofit Development Center of Southern New Jersey who are here. Uh, the organization is actually in a period of transition that is growing with some drama. Uh, we are fortunate, for example, to have TD Bank agree, have agreed to be the presenting sponsor of all of our programs for the duration of this year. Uh, so we're very excited about that. We have a board member from TD, Brian, Brian Keller. I think a round of applause since they gave us money. Good. Brian is a humble, self-effacing guy, so he will understand the applause was not for him personally. It was for the pot of money he represents. <laughs> Sitting out at the table, you met them on the way in, uh, Pat Bruder, who is affiliated with the organization upstairs that we've heard so much about this morning. Although, Pat, the name of your company is? All right, so she's one of those people who knows how to write all those fancy words down that get you lots of money. Is Sarah sitting next to you? All right, the other young lady that you met uh, when you came in is Sarah Piddington. She is the person who runs uh, the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Rowan. Uh, she runs the building you're in, and she is a vice president on our board. And the president of our board is sitting in the back row, Robert, Robert Dentino. Okay, so. Uh, next piece of housekeeping. We actually are going to have a program. It was important that you get to know one another. Uh, it's important that you get to know, perhaps some of you know this, TD, in addition to being nice enough to sponsor this and other programs for us, has its own program that basically pays for you to go to stuff like this. Do you know about this? Not if you do. If you do, I won't bother you with it. If you don't, I'll explain it to you. All right. You can get, for your organization, up to $1,000 per calendar year to pay for the costs of going to one-day conferences, certificate programs, stuff like that. You can't, it's not retroactive. You can't say, oh, well, back in the 40s, I went to uh, whatever, and, you know, would you guys give me some money for that? There are some restrictions. Uh, the mission focus has to be one of the following, affordable housing. I don't think there was anybody in the room who fell into that category. Increased economic development, focusing on small business. I would say that's a fairly broad category if you're creative. So talk to Jackie, she'll get you a, a creative way to say that you do that. Uh, financial literacy and after school or extracurricular programming that basically focuses on low and moderate income children. I'm going to guess that if you are involved in a library, some of what you do could, does focus on low and moderate income children. Some of you have specific missions that do that. Uh, so I think with, and you have to be a 501c3. So uh, we would be happy to tell you more about that, but that's pretty cool. So that's a thousand bucks that you can 
you know, you and your five closest friends from the library you can go to stuff like this and have be reimbursed for the cost of doing it. So we thank TD. What's the, name of that program? <clears throat> the name of that program is it trips off your tongue like Nonprofit Development Center of Southern New Jersey. The TD Charitable Foundation Nonprofit Training Resource Fund. And actually, if you're interested and you just make a little note on your form that says who you are, we will see that you get information directly from TD. Brian will make that happen. Okay, uh, we are coming to the end of all the FUFA, but we're not quite there. Uh, two things. First, a poll, and then we want you to hear from our uh, partner, the Center for Nonprofits, because all we do is stuff like this. We don't have affinity programs. We don't get you insurance at a lower rate. We don't have all the kinds of things that a trade association for not-for-profits, which is how I would describe the Center for Nonprofits. Deb would not describe it that way. Linda Zippa would not describe it that way. I would. We don't do all the things that they could do for you. We don't ask for membership dollars from you. We suggest that you become a member of the Center for Nonprofits. They want your membership dollars. We're just happy that you showed up. Uh, before we do that, a quick poll. And my friend Rob Harrington is actually going to look and count because this is for a purpose that I will not explain to you. How many of you have, for your organization, a YouTube channel? One, well, you don't count. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. How many of you, for your NPO, uh, have a Facebook page? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, about twenty. Okay. How many of you, this morning before you came here, figured out how to say in 144 characters that you were getting out of the shower and just about to deal with a bad hair day before you went off to a social media workshop? How many of you tweet? Eight. Okay. And how many of you as individuals, but for some obvious business purpose, uh, are represented on LinkedIn? Whoa. Okay. I think 42. Okay. Uh, that was for me. And I appreciate it. So now, Deb... Come and talk to these guys. Thank you very much. Here you go. Um, <clears throat> stuff down. Um, I'm Debbie Duncan. Uh, I'm with the Center for Nonprofits. Um, I want to thank ERC for hosting this. Um, I've known Pat Bruder for I don't know how many years because in my previous life I worked in uh, Camden. <laughs> so, and ER, EIRC was uh, helpful to us in some of the training that, that we did, including New Jersey After Three training. Hi, Free. I've talked to you on the phone. I haven't met you. <laughs> um, so anyway, I wanted to tell you, you have, I didn't bring enough of these. Um, I, I have this brochure uh, about the center. It uh, does, and we, I, will, I will get more to Michael. Um, we do basically three things. We provide cost savings opportunities to 501c3 charitable nonprofits in the state of New Jersey. We provide, which there's a sheet here that has some of the things that we offer, and we are constantly adding new ones. Um, we also provide technical assistance and training. Uh, the most, uh, the biggest piece right now that we're doing is we are we have gone to having an annual conference uh, in December, and we really try to look at what's coming down the pike. What do nonprofits need to have to be prepared for the future, which is a little hard these days. And finally, uh, and most silently and most importantly, uh, what we do is we advocate for nonprofits. Um, we educate the public and we educate legislators and policymakers. You have also, I've passed out, and there are some more on the back table, an economic force, downloadable from our website, uh, free uh, synopsis, sna snapshot of nonprofits in New Jersey. Um, for grant writing, for you know, making your case statements, for whatever, this can be a really handy piece. Um, we also have, uh, we just did a survey, we've done three years worth of uh, trends and outlook surveys on the economy, the impact on nonprofits, on our website, downloadable, 
please, um, please refer to it. I have a press release uh, out on the back table where the refreshments are. One of the things that we do is we let you know about late breaking news. If you checked your email this morning or if you check it later today and you don't have an email from us telling you that charities registration has just raised the requirement for audit from $250,000 gross revenues to $500,000 gross revenues for charitable nonprofits, you're not on our email list. Okay? This is really critical. I called an accounting firm with whom we have partnered on a variety of things yesterday, and she said, what? Why don't I know about this? <laughs> so um, maybe we're, you're, you know, we're the first ones to tell you about it. But um, this is um, not as good news for the accounting firms, but it's good news for, for nonprofits for whom an audit can often be a financial burden, um, especially in these times. Um, Therefore, if you pick up our charitable fundraising law fly, uh, summary flyer out there, it's outdated. <laughs> so just make, make a note of that. This and a variety of other materials on insurance, on uh, lobbying, advocacy, uh, are all, again, they're on our website, they're downloadable. So please look there. The other, uh, the other piece of news is um, we've been trying to get the word out for the last three years that the IRS is going to be revoking any nonprofit organization that does not register through the 990 system. There's a postcard, very easy to do. It will take you a few minutes. You just need a little bit of information about your organization. Um, they're going to be issuing the list of revoked statuses, organizations that have not filed, that they're saying, okay, you're no longer, you no longer have your exempt status. If your organization or one you know shows up on that list, please contact us. We are currently gathering resources to help people uh, address that if, in fact, an existing organization is revoked. We have things like thinking of forming a nonprofit, downloadable on our website. Every time somebody calls and says, gee, I've got this really, really great idea, and I, I always say, please read the booklet. Call me back. Um, one of the things that we do in this booklet is tell you to really think hard um, because it's not just a fun, great idea. Uh, it's starting a business. It's starting an organization. But in here is the information that you need to, to start that organization well prepared and in a legal and, and well planned way. So those are some of the materials very quickly that we have. I do want to uh, say that uh, I'm, I'm really glad you did that poll because I've been trying to get my boss to start up a LinkedIn page, and boy, <laughs> I just got some ammunition today. <laughs> um, I also, uh, as I said about the email list, get on our email list. We send out a newsletter once a month. We send out notices like this every so often and policy um, notices, but it's you know max for a month. So you're not going to get flooded with stuff from us. But go to our website. We have a lot of information there. We're there for charitable nonprofits in New Jersey. Oh, we have a resource list, uh, TD Bank. I want to put your funding opportunity on our website. We also have uh, lists of 20 different categories of people who provide services for nonprofits. So for the for-profits here, you can get on that list. And when people call and say, I need insurance, or I'm looking for help with fundraising, or whatever it is, you'll be on there. Thank you very much, and thanks, Michael. All right. Thanks for uh, joining us, coming all the way from, you know, if you're north of, uh, <coughs> I don't know, Burlington City, you're from North Jersey. I came from Atlantic City, so. It oh, all right. Well, way to, <laughs> way to screw that up for me, Deb. All right. Uh, upcoming events. Uh, this fall, dates to be determined. Why we click with some and clank with others. You've done the Myers-Briggs thing where you end up in one quadrant and somebody else that you're supposed to be dealing with is in another quadrant and you don't understand why that's a bad thing. All right, so the people from Team Builders Plus will present their most popular uh, seminar. We will have the Pascal Sykes Foundation, which is working in South Jersey on community collaboration techniques, uh, talking about community collaboration. As you may know, if you know that foundation, their goal, they have a specific mission goal, which is two-parent families. They will not be talking about that. They will be talking about the tools that they use to create community collaboration at the grassroots level. 
We will have ethics training for not-for-profits uh, with a retired uh, IRS executive. We will have financial management for not-profits uh, presented by a member of our board, Wanda Hardy, uh, from Creditworthy. And we will have social entrepreneurship, meaning you can make money doing the things you do. And that'll be uh, a panel discussion that will be facilitated by our president, Bob Dentino. All right, so that's what's coming up. Today, we have the uh, three bald guys and the babe. And uh, they are each remarkably successful people in the world of social media. They understand that, and we chose this particular slide to share with you. We didn't put all of the various portals to the world of social media up here. We just put the ones that you have to be conversant with. All right? So the other ones that you know about that aren't up here, we don't think are important. These are the ones we're going to cover today. Come on. Nothing more than a titter? All right. Uh, we're going to be much more limited than that. And we do have a very prospective approach to this, which is why we're calling it the future of social media. But it will be very hands-on at the same time. Uh, first person is going to talk to you, Rob Harrington, who is the uh, founder and CEO of Mana Design Works. He's the chairman of the Gloucester County Chamber of Commerce. Uh, he is a former law enforcement professional. And his firm just acquired a center city Philadelphia firm, Pfeiffer Advertising, or Pfeiffer, which is it? Pfeiffer Advertising. So they are expanding. You'll hear from Steve Lebetkin, who has been nice enough to put all this fancy-looking stuff up here and to give me this so that we can record it. Uh, and Steve is uh, undoubtedly the dean of podcasting, vidcasting. I was going to say in southern New Jersey, that wouldn't be fair, probably in the entire cosmos, maybe on some intergalactic basis. But uh, I found this fascinating. I think it's fun to tell you things about people that you wouldn't know. Uh, he was the first journalist to use portable computer technology in the field, and he did it when he was reporting on a Grateful Dead concert in 1977, when he was in junior high school, by the way, so, all right? Uh, he had an email address on his business card as far back as 1988, so either he had nothing else to put on his business card or he was very prescient about where the, uh, where the world was going. And he began designing websites uh, in 1994. All right, Jen Regina has, I don't know, you could say that being America's most convenient bank, you know, is this like marketing hyperbole or is it true? Well, Jen Regina has a company called The Marketing of Everything, which pretty much includes the stuff that you guys do and that everybody else in the whole world does. So everything, that's a lot of stuff. I mean, there's nothing that Jen is not in a position to talk to you about, and actually it's not hyperbole, as is the case with the other three presenters. Uh, Jen worked for Mattel, for Nielsen Research, so she has a fairly, you know, not fairly, a very impressive uh, professional background that she brings to now the business of uh, not only teaching here at Rowan, but uh, working with organizations like yours. And Howard Yermish is fresh off being recognized last night by the Burlington County Chamber of Commerce, on whose board he sits, uh, for his efforts in terms of promoting business in the region. So he was a winner of one of the Burlington County Chamber's Voice of Business Awards. He's also won a bunch of other awards. His wife seemed fairly ratified by the fact that he was getting an award from a professional organization, hoping that profits would be immediately behind the awards, right? Uh, all right. So. Uh, each of these folks, including Steve, could talk to you about what each of the others are going to talk to you about. They have experience across the board. We have asked them to carve up what they're going to do. So, there we go. So, you guys are the one, the one person on the bottom with the spiked hair and the wide open eyes, just so you know. And we've talked to you about TD. We do have a lot to cover today. These are some of the things we're going to talk to you about. And if you were close enough to read it, that is actually a fairly reasonable map of how some of the social media interactions work. Basically, all we need you to know for starters is it's about a conversation. The conversation is taking place through various 
portals through various means with various tools, and you can either be part of it or not. And if you're not, you do that at your own peril. Uh, I love this uh, Dilbert cartoon. If you can't read it, the person on the left is saying, as the marketing manager for social media, my job is to use two words a lot, Facebook and Twitter. Marketing through social media is like herding cats. And just to make it interesting, many of the cats are drunk and stupid. <laughs> All right, and then the rest of it has to do with previous panels. So here we are. The question for you is, are you a digital native or a digital immigrant? Some of you, based on your age, I'm assuming, are digital natives. You've grown up with it. It means nothing to you to be using these tools. That's just a part of life. For some of us, like I'm a pencil and eraser native. Okay? So you possibly see the difference. <clears throat> for those of you who are immigrants, this is a really good seminar. For those of you who are natives, you will understand some of it intuitively, and you will walk out knowing a whole lot more than when you came in. All right, this is our panel of experts, and I told you what the subtitle is, but I won't repeat it for fear of further infuriating Rob, Steve, and Howard. Uh, every panel needs a moderator uh, because, you know, fights can break out. That person there uh, in 1995 was involved in a three-round boxing match as a freelancer for the National Enquirer, not the Philadelphia Enquirer, but he also worked at one time for the Philadelphia Enquirer. And he was fighting the female middleweight champion of California, who in her day job was a prison guard with a black belt. So we have hired him today to come to be the facilitator for this event. That's it. You don't look impressed. I just told you I went three rounds with a female middleweight champion of California <laughs> when I was a much younger person, had dark hair, a mustache. That sadly is still there. It's just a different color. All right. So here's what we're going to cover. Rob's going to tell us how we got here and deal with the idea of how it has to integrate. It doesn't stand alone. It's part of what you do. Steve's going to talk about the... the podcasting, vidcasting side of all this. Jen is going to talk uh, specifically about some of those tools. Howard is going to be the futurist and tell you where we're going to end up. Uh, along the way, here's what we want you to do. There is a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Ten dollars, real American cash money, will be awarded at the conclusion of this workshop to the member of the audience who comes up with the best idea for some other member of the audience. So if Matt Hayden says EIRC ought to do this, he's welcome to say that while anybody's talking. And these guys are going to pepper what they have to say with thoughts that would be specific, for, for example, maybe to Bancroft or to the State Library or to whatever. So we would like to have those ideas just be spontaneously interspersed with the stuff we're going to cover in a more deliberate way. So. There is a conversation. Where do you fit? Remember, don't become a proponent of or a victim of digital Darwinism. It is not about who talks the most and the loudest. You may think so, but it's not. All right? Rob. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Again, thank you for uh, coming out for the presentation. Uh, again, my name is Rob Harrington, own Man of Design Works. We're a uh, creative marketing firm. Uh, I've been asked to uh, handle the first part of this presentation uh, to put things in perspective with the social media. Uh, we want to just address some items about the traditional websites. Um, kind of helps to see where we're going, where we came from a little bit. It's not going to be a boring history lesson, um, but I think it'll, it'll help uh, the rest of the program mean a little bit more to you. Um, <clears throat> traditional websites. Just as a, as a brief recent recap, we know right now there's about 255 million websites last year. That's going up, last year at least, went up by over 21 million. Uh, that's a lot of websites. And it's growing probably at that rate for, for some time now. Um, just when you think there aren't enough websites out there, we're going to add another 21 billion, uh, million every year. Uh, almost 2 billion internet users. That number is also increasing uh, very quickly. We know that the traditional websites have, are, for a while now, have been the central hub for information. 
Uh, we know they're the core of most marketing efforts. You don't see anything printed these days without driving it to a website. And we also know that arguably um, it's one of the most cost-effective ways of delivering information uh, to, your, to your target audience. The, uh, aside from the marketing element of the web, one of the things that makes it so powerful is it's just a, the core of a lot of business interaction. Aside from being sold things online, buying things online, you have every government agency is starting to use the online tools. Um, so it really is, you know, whether it's for your taxes or, or uh, filling out any other type of form, it really is a, a, a central hub for business interaction. We know the website in general, when we say traditional websites, can include anything from brochure sites, e-commerce, catalogs, uh, the directories, blogs, online libraries, how-to, webcasts, which we'll get into a little bit more, um, video blogs. These are what we all consider the traditional web. One element about the traditional web is uh, that it's, it's, it's out there, there's a lot of it, but it, everybody always asking, do we really need social? The clients all the time say, we have a great website presence, we get a lot of hits, why do I have to get into social? Um, we have, you know, any one of our clients could have three or four of those things going at one time. We say absolutely. Um, traditional websites, they offer control. This is another thing that puts perspective into social media. Um, control, we mean, you know, the, whether it's the content, the advertising, the branding. We love Facebook, but at the same time, the Facebook ads that show up on your, your company's Facebook site can be for absolutely anything related to the visitor. So you'd have absolutely no control of those ads. We once saw an uh, economic development summit where logging in and they took a copy of the Facebook page actually had a Victoria's Secrets ad. So, uh, and that was not on my Facebook account, of course. Um, but so you have, to, you have absolutely no control over that, that advertising. Um, but still, it's still a good tool. Um, we know with the traditional websites, centralized hub, you can do just about everything. Every other form of communication can lead and direct people to the website itself. Um, so it all works together. It works as that, that core of the, uh, your traditional marketing. Um, we also know by far it has the largest user base, though that number is, is getting, uh, the, the difference is getting smaller. Uh, with almost two, 2 billion users, there's still a tremendous uh, majority of people using the Internet. Just the same, we still say absolutely you need social media. And uh, just to say some, you know, why some of the highlights, and we'll get into some more of the details with the other presenters, is there are traditional, there are pieces missing from the traditional websites. The, uh, tr we always look at the, the traditional website as the uh, digital equivalent of a brick and mortar presence. You can have a store set up, you can have customers coming and going, but it doesn't mean there's conversations going about your store. It doesn't mean people are going to be constantly thinking about your store. It's, it's there. Um, traditional websites are very passive entities. They're out there, and if you don't do something to drive people to your site, if you don't do something to encourage people to talk about you and to talk about your site, they can sit there with no visitors, uh, which makes them kind of useless. Traditional websites have no or very, very limited sharing. This day and age, everything is about sharing. You hear that word sharing comes up so many different times, so many different ways. Traditional websites really don't encourage sharing. Um, you, you can, I mean, just like a digital, just like a store, you can tell somebody and you can hope that one of your customers pass that on, but there's no active encouragement to get people to spread the word about your, your store. Same with the website. Uh, very limited visitor engagement. They come to the site, they may purchase something from you. It's a one-way, very quick transaction. Uh, but you're not really engaging them in any type of uh, thought-provoking, intelligent way. People like to talk. People like to share thoughts and ideas. Uh, traditional websites, very limited uh, sense, do that. Very often, traditional websites are static. Um, other than changing your product, changing your price, there may not be a lot of call. And it's, not, it's, it's understandable sometimes, but it's hard to keep a site constantly fresh and active without saying something new all the time. And that's one of the other elements that traditional media, or I'm sorry, the traditional sites are, are limited in. So like we said, we, we absolutely believe as much as the websites, they're not going anywhere. Traditional media um, is not going anywhere. You're still going to have handouts, you're still going to have flyers, TV ads. Um, you still absolutely need social. It's an entire new avenue of interacting and engaging clients. Uh, really, it's going to help you maximize the effectiveness of all of all your other advertising. Uh, especially the websites. Um, and I always like to just throw out one word of caution. Uh, social media, it's not a standalone answer to marketing. We've also heard the reverse. We've had clients say, do I need social media to have a website? We've seen other people say, you know, we're going to skip the web. I'm not going to do really any business cards. I'm just going to tell them to go to our Facebook and you know, I'm going to get them on our, our LinkedIn. 
Um, it's not a standalone answer. All the other forms of advertising that are out there, it really works hand in hand with. Um, it's not going to replace it. So the other thing that we, we want to look at is aside from being not standalone, it has to be managed. We see a lot of clients that will say, you know, my, my nephew's going to handle my Twitter for me. They'll go through great lengths to make sure that their marketing message and their marketing plan is followed very closely, but then they'll have somebody who has absolutely no background in marketing or doesn't even know what the marketing plan for the organization is get on there and just start saying things. If, if you do anything else, make sure that that social media is given the same attention as any other form of marketing. It's got to be handled on the same, uh, the same plan. And that is my intro. I believe, Steve, you're up next. So good morning, everyone. This is, uh, this is very meta for me. That's an expression that uh, technologists use when they're talking about the data behind the data. But you know, to be the podcaster and to be podcasting a podcast of myself is, is, is a very unusual podcasting. about podcasting is uh, extremely intense. Uh, so something like that, exactly. Exactly. So you're getting a uh, peek at a program I did for the State Department a couple of years ago since I came not prepared to talk with slides, but I will talk with slides. How many of you listen to podcasts today? How many of you produce podcasts? How many of you would like to produce podcasts? That's good. That's good. So to, to just set the stage for what is a podcast, because people do ask that from time to time, you go back to the early 90s when the digital audio engineers came up with the MP3 format that you may be familiar with from the uh, audio files, the music files that you download from iTunes. And those of us doing any kind of web work have been hanging MP3 files off of websites since the early 90s. And there's nothing particularly dramatic about hanging a, an audio file as a link off of a website. No big deal. But what happened was, uh, around the mid-90s, the fellow on the right here, um, Adam Curry, and this is another generational thing. How many of you remember MTV when they actually played music videos? Okay. Adam Curry was one of the first VJs on MTV. And sometime in the early 90s, he became uh, aware of the World Wide Web. And he thought this was a really cool way to communicate with music fans and so forth. And he went to the suits who run MTV, and this is an imagined conversation. He goes in and says, hey, we've got to have a website. We can put pictures of bands. We can put music, blah, blah, blah. And the suits say to him, just go back and play more music videos, please. And so he does, but in the meantime, he goes out and he registers the domain mtv.com. And a couple, of, you know, a couple of months pass, and there's a big uh, legal action in Chicago where someone has done exactly the same thing with mcdonalds.com. And McDonald's takes them to court and wins the first landmark lawsuit about cyber squatting. And so the suits at MTV are looking in the newspaper and they see this lawsuit in Chicago and they say, hmm, we better register MTV before something like this happens to us. And they go out and they try to register it and they discover that it's already registered to one of their employees. So the, the next conversation with Mr. Curry is, you know, nice job, we'll take it over and lovely parting gifts, you're out the door. And he did leave MTV with lovely parting gifts. He started his own uh, thing. He is now a podcaster full time. He does a, uh, uh, it's a, it's a very difficult to listen to podcast. It's very uh, reflexive, you know, uh, self, self indulgent is the way I would put it. Um, but he did do one thing that's really important to podcasting. And as he got together with this guy, Dave Weiner, who is the father of RSS. How many of you know what an RSS feed is? Okay. So Dave Weiner actually invented the programming. And when he got together with Adam Curry, they figured out the way to put the enclosure tag in the RSS feed. And it's that tag that tells you through the feed where the podcast is. Now, in the early 90s, there was a, uh, a service that came out called um, Pointcast. Does anybody remember Pointcast? Howard Wood. It, is a, it was a service, a great idea. Customized news delivered right to your desktop. And all you have to do is download this little piece of software and tell us what kind of news you want. So they did this. There was one problem with it. Every couple of hours, they were pushing huge blobs of news to everyone who had this software. And when you got into a company where two or 3,000 people had all downloaded Pointcast, every couple of hours, the network administrators were getting hit with this flood of large blobs of pictures and video and audio hitting their servers and taking, literally in the, in the early 90s, when you didn't have bandwidth, taking the network down. 
So the big breakthrough in podcasting was this RSS feed, which is very, very thin. It's just text. It, they're not sending you the file. They're just sending you the location of the file. And that's why it became the, the standard for what we do. Um, there are a number of ways to listen to podcasts. We can talk about those if you want. There are some people doing quirky podcasts. These guys started early on. Uh, Dawn and Drew, how many of you have heard of them? One of the most popular podcasts. Do you listen to Dawn and Drew? Not anymore, but you guys should get out more. <laughs> Well, they started, they, they, they were, it's, they, they were now, by now, they're like a mid-30s couple. They started, they were mid-20s. Uh, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, living in a farmhouse in Wisconsin and podcasting from their kitchen, uh, mostly about their sex life. This is one of those not safe for work uh, podcasts. Um, and they have like thousands of listeners. And they actually got a, a condom manufacturer as a sponsor at one point. Um, the Catholic Insider is an interesting podcast. Father Roderick uh, is a uh, Dutch priest, and he's become something of a podcasting uh, rock star in Europe. He's done some, uh, there's some really wild videos of him entering a conference like this, w accompanied by a, a choir of Gregorian chanters um, with smoke and all kinds of special effects. But he did some really interesting uh, work at the Vatican when Pope John Paul II died, and that was... Um, uh, recordings in Vatican Square, St. Peter's Square, when they were getting ready to announce that the Pope had been elected. And he was recording in stereo, and if you put on headphones, you actually felt the presence of being in St. Peter's Square. You could sense the spatial relationship of the crowd and the bells ringing in the background and the people cheering when the white smoke came out. It was really dramatic uh, kind of radio broadcasting, the old-time radio broadcasting that I grew up with. Um, so there's all kinds of ways that people can do this. I think you know, some of the important reasons for doing podcasting, it's a way to control the content. How many of you have tried to get the mainstream news media to cover one of your events in the community? How many of you have been really successful at it? How many of you have been moderately successful? How many of you can't get anyone to show up at your events? I mean, the, 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 the tumult that the media is going through right now makes it imperative for you to think about the purpose of this presentation, becoming the media, being your own broadcaster. And by producing radio shows or TV shows on the web, you can become the media and get your message out in a way that meets your needs. It's portable. People can take it with them. We don't advocate people watching the video podcasts while they're driving, but people certainly do listen to audio while they're in the car. You can download it to a music device. You can put it on a CD. Um, it's very portable. And the other thing is the demographics have changed. Very few people are watching TV or listening to radio at the time the show airs. Michael referred to DVRing this event by watching the podcast. Um, People below a certain age group almost never watch TV at the time the show is scheduled. They're DVRing it. Um, and, and that's just a fact you have to deal with. People expect to get the content when they want the content, not when you want to deliver it. Um, and the advantage is you can record these shows. These are not live shows. They're recorded. So you can spend some time editing. You can do the post-production. And, you know, it's very easy to get into it. The, the barriers to entry are low. If you have some editing expertise, it doesn't take that much to acquire, you can produce some very nice uh, conversations. And you, people can learn something about your organizations. Some reasons you should do it. Podcast users, the surveys have shown, survey says, uh, they are predisposed to online messaging. They're already online. They're 36% more likely, and this is a few years ago, to have made an online purchase. Four times more likely to have bought music online. They spend 50% more time online than most users, and they're more likely to click on relevant advertising. And we can measure how people download podcasts. There's a number of ways to do that. Um, you can track what they're listening to. There are feed statistics you can look at. But basically, it's a, a great way for you to be telling your story. There's a, the other most important thing that I didn't discuss and you should think about is how the search engines treat um, audio and video content. And that is, how many of you heard the story about JCPenney a couple weeks ago getting spanked by Google? Okay, what happened was JCPenney was using, and you've all heard of, and you're probably all trying to get your arms around search engine optimization, right? Okay, so there are good ways and there are bad ways of doing search engine optimization. And the folks here, I 
uh, I'm pretty comfortable saying, are doing it the white hat way. But J.C. Penney hired a firm that did it the black hat way. And the black hat way is they create link farms that are just a bunch of links that repeat over and over the relevant keywords for their clients. And then that's supposed to raise you up in the Google search. Well, when Google found out this was being done, they not only rewrote the algorithm to prevent that from happening, they also spanked J.C. Penney by pushing them to the bottom of the search for a period of time. Um, so the message there is you, you're not going to game the system when the system is, is produced by people who buy Ph.D. mathematicians by the boatload to work for them. You, you're not going to win that way. The way you win is producing good quality, original content, and audio and video helps you move stuff up. And the story I'll tell you and I'll conclude with, a couple of years ago we were producing um, video podcasts for Walmart stores in South Jersey. Walmart, like many of you, does a lot of events in the community and gets very little attention from the media for it. So we started producing what, what we call uh, video news wrappers. We, we do a package report as if we were covering it for Channel 6 News. We go to the store, we take pictures of the marching band and the cheerleaders, we interview the store manager, we interview the Boys and Girls Club kids who are getting the scholarships, and then we put it all together as a news report on the web. When we first started doing this, we would put in, I, I'm thinking like a PR guy, we put into the metadata around the podcast my contact information, because I'm thinking, oh, in case the news media wants to contact me, they will be able to get in touch with me. And all of a sudden, the phone rings in the office, and I pick it up and go, professional podcast, and someone says, oh, I thought I was calling Walmart. And I'm like, why do they think they're calling Walmart? And they say, which store do you want? And it was the store that we had just done one of these video podcasts at. So it ended up, I was getting so many calls, I, I, I put on my whiteboard, I put a little list of the stores we had been at, because it still wasn't dawning on me, People were Googling, and this is consumer behavior, folks, Googling Walmart Deptford to find out the store phone number. They're not going to the website the way they used to because it was too many clicks to find it. It's easier to just go Walmart Deptford, and they picked the first phone number that came up, and it was mine because the videos were at the top of the search. That was the aha moment for me. So we changed the metadata to say the Walmart store in Deptford is located at street address, and the phone number of the store is, and the call stopped. And so the power of the video and audio to bring you up, I can't guarantee it's going to take you to the top, but bring you up in a Google search, it's really critical to think about having that as part of your strategy. Thanks. Okay, uh, good morning. I wanted to cover now kind of where we're at for social media and try to give you some tips to use for Twitter and Facebook, LinkedIn, and maybe things that you're already doing, but kind of some additional ideas maybe to take you to the next level. So again, we've kind of talked a lot about what is social media. It's sharing, discussing information. Um, like Mike said, there's a conversation that's going on. It's usually integration of, of course, telecommunications, social interaction. It's different for every single individual because of who you follow, who's your fans, who's your connections. And it's a use of words, and we said pictures, videos, and audio. And all of these dynamics should be used. Why social media works for nonprofits. So I added some additional information here from what I usually uh, discuss for for-profit business. And of course, the first thing is it's definitely interactive. And that's the best thing about it. It creates engagement and interest in what you're discussing. It's easy, and it should be also create a, a, make it fun to donate to your cause, whether it's, sense, it's financial or a sense of time. A sense of urgency it does create, especially for if you're using something like Twitter. Uh, they have created a, it's called Twitter Vest, or Twitter Festival where um, it's a one-day united campaign. And I think the last time was about 137 um, nonprofits participated in it, and they raised up raising over a million dollars. And it created the sense of urgency through Twitter for people to participate. It was a national movement, but it was actually at the local level. Um, it's for creating advocacy. It's also great for cause marketing. 
you can use it to permit to promote large donors or kind of give additional recognition to those that participate in your foundation. Uh, it allows you to provide frequent updates and kind of what um, Rob had talked about, you know, a website is great because it kind of, it, it, the problem with it is it, it can be more static. Where here, you can provide frequent updates, inform them what's going on, if there's a change of venue, if there's additional information that you want to get out, it allows you to, to do that whether through Twitter or Facebook. And of course, lastly, it, it does drive traffic to your website. And what Rob ended with is really important to have inter, total integration. So have social media, but it's one piece of your entire marketing program, and definitely do not have it as your sole focus. Um, you want to make sure that in your traditional, in your print media, everything is tied in through social media, but never just depend upon it. Because think of it this way, if you know, Mark Zuckerberg decides that he wants to charge for a Facebook page, or something happens, you wouldn't want to have that control in that, just with your fan page. You want to make sure that you always control your business, your nonprofit, and have that website there, and use social media as kind of a, a supporting principle. The nonprofit rules of engagement that I came up with, number one, of course, is listen. Make sure that you're paying attention to your constituents. Be able, though, to give up control. And, and what I mean is sometimes I've gone on nonprofit Facebook pages and I've decided to like them. It's a certain cause that I'm interested in. And I realize I've liked them and I can get information about what's going on, but I cannot comment. They have it very restricted because they're afraid maybe perhaps of negative feedback or of losing control. And it becomes less interesting, less engaging. So make sure that you have your Facebook page set up to allow posts. I even suggest video, photographs, you know, comments. Have it so as, as much engagement can go on as possible. When you start to restrict, you're going to start cutting back on people's interest in your fan page. Always tell a compelling story. No, don't be afraid to upload or um, put out YouTube videos. Make sure that you create a cohesive story through all of your sites. Um, have a goal of long-term relationships. One of the biggest things is in, in, in profit and nonprofit, they start a social media framework. And then they're, they're looking at the fans as, as a, a judgment on whether or not the page is doing well. And you don't put restrictions or, or say, oh, I have to have 100 fans. I have to have 300 fans. I have to have 500 by the end of the week. It should naturally grow. If you're doing everything effectively, people are going to start talking. You'll have you know, good word of mouth. Have some patience and look at it more you know, as a long term. And years ago, if you would say, OK, for social media to develop, it is going to take a long time, meaning a year or two. Now it can be a few months, but give it time to grow and nurture it. Uh, also really consider local company tie-ins. Don't isolate yourself on, in any kind of social media framework. If you are a nonprofit or a profit, look to see what others are doing. Research and see who has a really good fan page, who has a really good Twitter account, and then cross-promote. And then say, you know, I would love to talk about your cause if you talk about my cause. Because those individuals might fit your target market, might be the same, have the same interests, and it's easy to access if you kind of cross-promote. It shouldn't cost anything. It should be very easy to promote um, with even though local companies or local supporters. This is one example that I found on Facebook that does, a, of course, does an excellent job, um, Amnesty International. And I want to talk, talk a little bit about the tabs that they have to your left. They have, of course, your traditional wall. And this was, their, this was one of their landing pages that they had set up. So you can get all the information that's happening. Um, when I went to this, I guess, a few, few nights ago, it was 14 hours ago they had updated through Hootsuite. So I also suggest to manage your social media. You consider using Hootsuite, um, TweetDeck, something where you can keep control of all of your sites. Uh, they have a great 191 people liked the information that they posted. And as you can see, they had good engagement, 27 comments that they had about um, the information that they put out there. They also have, of course, an information tab, which should have all of your social media links. You should have your website, anything that you know, a, a participant would go to would want to get additional information. Uh, we have a ta another tab called Take Action. Here you'll be able to volunteer time. You could actually make a donation. They have a store where you could purchase information, a blog. Again, donate effectively right away. They have a YouTube link, events, and so forth. So you can see that their page is very dynamic, has a lot of content. It's not going to bore the individual that's coming there. They can go for information. They can go there to donate. They, it's very well done. 
Um, this is the Take Action tab. So it talks about investigate torture and forced virginity testing on Egyptian women. You can see it also talks at the very top, you can donate directly. You can share this information. You can invite friends. It makes it very simple and very easy. We talked about sharing you know, on websites. Sometimes it's difficult. And more and more websites are putting tabs to Facebook and Twitter. And, and you know, the newer ones are making it so it's easy. But this is a key, key um, positive area to, show, to share information very quickly. Um, and then the tab, of course, the donate here alone, the candle's fragile, shared by millions. It becomes a shining beacon of hope. It says, click here if you wish to become a monthly donor. It makes it very easy for someone who's interested in donating to, to sign up, to share this information, to make it viral. Um, and, get, and back to making it easy to donate, there's so many widgets out there, and, and you can, it, probably, I would say, for your institution, for your nonprofit, you should kind of research what would be best for you. Um, an example here, uh, a chip-in widget creation. It's very easy. It's they're pretty much set up as wizards. You can use an existing Facebook account, um, an existing Facebook event. In this case, it was Van City's Bike Share. A new widget can be created and posted to your Facebook profile in about a minute. So you can easily have um, fundraising or donations set up for your nonprofit. Success with social media. This was a, a study I had found, to, uh, surveyed 1,200 nonprofits. It was from blog.moredonors.com, and about 85% use Facebook. And it, when I, I did a lot of research, many different studies, and it was about 80 to 90% said they used Facebook. Now, to what extent? I don't know. Are they just having a fan page? Are they, you know, using it to raise money and inform. I don't know how that is. But as you can see, Facebook is the number one vehicle. Second, of course, would be Twitter. Um, YouTube, third is YouTube. And so it's really important to have a YouTube channel, to use it effectively, to tie it in through your Facebook and your Twitter. Then, of course, LinkedIn, which we saw was very popular here today. Um, Flickr, of course, for photos. And then MySpace. We won't even talk. Yeah, we're not going to talk about MySpace. So uh, the dollars given. Um, you can see the largest, these tells you kind of the percentage or the amounts collected. Um, if you want to raise over $100,000, we have Facebook, it was a 0.5%. Um, but in general, we're about under $100,000, excuse me, under $1,000 was uh, the, the um, fundraising revenue on the social networks from this survey. I wanted to go to another nonprofit example because I know we have a lot of Rowan uh, representatives, yay, here today. And, uh, and I, of course, follow everything I can on Rowan for through all of, all of their Facebook, and, and I love how they have each, for each individual school, engineering and business and so forth. Uh, but I also wanted to kind of give you some ideas going forward to see maybe if you can make some improvements or maybe see what your competition's doing. So I brought up, I know, Rutgers as an example. Um, so when you go to their home page, their, or their landing page, I should say, it says, homecoming through your eyes, this guy ate the most wings. I kind of, of course gave him some anonymity because I didn't want to announce him too much. But so this is the contest page is what they're right now showcasing on Rutgers page. It's an idea because, of course, you know, maybe not all alumni would be interested in this, but they're probably, you know, going through different target markets and trying to attract interest. Um, the overall target market for social media where your nonprofits are getting the biggest bang for their buck are 30 to 49-year-olds. Those individuals that that uh, age group is the most interested in getting information from nonprofits through social media. They're looking for meaningful conversation. They must, you must provide credible and trustworthy information, of course, because they will take your information and they will Google it. They will research it and to make sure that what you're saying to them um, is appropriate. Unfortunately, the 50 plus, although that's a huge growing target market in social media, at this point, they're, not, they're, they're still feeling a lack of trust dealing with maybe donations and what you have to say. So um, that market is growing in general on social media. We just kind of have to gain their trust in, in for nonprofits. The under 30 love social media, of course, but they also lack the giving power. So they are more into donating their time. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're more into donating, you know, sharing information, sharing things, but of course, the financial side there wouldn't be as uh, your, your primary target market. And then they wanted a community discussions, not individual conversation. So of course, you know, your traditional Facebook profile, people go back and forth at individual things about themselves and so forth, where here they want generally larger, more community or, uh, discussions that they can get involved in. 
Desired topics that they have for your target market is your, the impact of your nonprofit. What are you doing? Tell me about it. How successful are you? They want to learn about your organization. Tell me what's going on about it. Things I don't know. You know, even if you updated with here's you know the the uh, uh, something you know week every week that you would update that you don't know about an organization that we could provide for you or that we do, and that would be news to them and interesting for them. Um, success stories, huge. They want to know your success stories. And it doesn't have to be financially, of course, successful. It could be what you've done in the community. So definitely promote what you're, you're doing. And then lastly, just updates, ongoing, what's happening, things, cha things that are changing, and so forth. Um, be aware, of course, the uh, issues for nonprofits. Make sure that you're registered, that you can put disclaimers about states that you can accept donations, and make sure that you have a social media policy you make sure that you have a policy in place. This is for profits or, or nonprofits because you might have people within your network or in your community wanting also to help out and going to your business page on Facebook and posting information, and that can be that can be a problem. Um, I was I was talking about on Friday I, my one class that I'm teaching at Rowan. I've already had four students that have been fired within the last year, and it was all because of a social media status update on Facebook. And one was very innocent. She said. Um, a big, one of our big snowstorms was coming, and she put, I really hope that we get the 12 inches because I don't feel like going to work tomorrow. So she came in the next day, and the rest, it was a restaurant owner. He said, thanks, no thanks, we don't need you. We saw your status update. And she said, well, I, I, you know, every young kid says they don't want to go to school or work. No, we don't want that negativity here. So I had another student who works for a bank, and she would put on her status, promote what was happening, like uh, we're offering a credit card special or so forth, and she got in trouble for that. She also went to her fan page, the company fan page. She saw that the people weren't responding from the company about a question a customer had, and it drove her nuts. Four days it sat there. So she went and answered it. Oh, she got called in. She's like, you're not, you know, you're not, you can't answer it, even though you work for the company, you know, just a college student, you're just assistant manager, there's no way we can have you do that. So. And she's like, well, I didn't know. I didn't know I could. So you make sure that you have these policies. What you, know, you have all these supporters. You never know someone who's just a fan could be answering your questions on pages. And these are just some quick statistics for Facebook in general. Again, more than 500 million active users. People spend 3.5 billion minutes a day around the world on Facebook. That's very scary. I don't know if that's why we're in a recession, but it's very scary. Um, 160 million objects were posted on Facebook in June, and then just from this October, it went from 160 to 900 million. So that's, to me, that's just unbelievable how much people are sharing of information. And again, it's growing in all target markets. 50 plus has, has huge growth. I just read an article on NewJersey.com this week. I'm sure you saw it, that you know, senior citizens are rocking social media. I mean, it's unbelievable that how much how fast it's growing. They're having um, pretty much social media seminars, at, you know, assisted living facilities, and just how to get involved. And, and it makes sense, you know, how they can keep in touch with their families, especially if they're apart. They, they, they want information, you know, they want, do they want a continuing of life. And if, there's, if they can't physically at times, they can definitely still grow mentally, so. Um, these are just some tips also to use your, for your Facebook fan page, and this works for profit or nonprofit. You wanna make sure that you, friend or follow or fan or connect with news reporters, radio DJ, DJs, local community leaders, politicians, anyone that you could reach out to that could help you. And we were talking about you know, how, how to create your own television show or create your own radio show. Definitely have that option and then say, look, if, you're, if you are, have any kind of connection with these individuals, you could say, send them the link. You could say, look what I've already done for you. And these news reporters, it's a tough time out there. It's really tough competing with, you know, with, for attention. And they, they want help. So sometimes I've even seen reporters, I said one of them, Dan Quayer, put in his status, you know, I'm looking for the top you know, 10 ideas, local. This was local South Jersey, local South Jersey ideas. And the best one, I'm going to go ahead and send to my producer and we'll do a report on it. So people that followed him, the 10 people or 20 people, 100 people put ideas. It was a great way of reaching out to the community and, and getting perhaps your idea on the news. 
Um, again, make sure they have a really good fan page. You can change it up. I suggest you do your landing page like I showed you with Amnesty. Have your wall sometimes. Concentrate on a contest. Concentrate you know, on a video or um, pictures, anything that would make it interesting to keep going back. Promote your status and, and um, with contests or promotions. Make sure that you're getting word out there what you're doing. Uh, people sometimes use Facebook as marketing research tool or Twitter as a marketing, marketing research tool. Everyone who posts their comment or opinion is entered into a drawing. So say, how do you feel about this? You know, all the people that are enter, entered in, you can use third-party apps that will easily set this up for you. Um, and you can make sure that you're getting kind of feedback and research information. And I just want to mention the other part to pay attention to your fan page is to really make sure that you're looking at the insights section. It's pretty much Google Analytics for Facebook. And it tells you your users, your new likes, uh, how active they are, and it, how many new fans. And it gives you a nice uh, overall summary of what's going on. There's also another tab. It's called, uh, yes, you, uh, users that brings up, actually we'll show you demographics. I think I have a slide for that. Yeah, it, it, most people don't know about the second piece. If you go down, scroll down, it'll show you. This is for my fan page, and I have a pretty much split between female and, ma and uh, female male. The age demographic would make sense. I fit in that. And then it even talks to you, talks to you about the countries, people that follow you, the cities, and languages. So it can kind of give you an idea if your fan page is attracting the correct target market that you're interested in um, pursuing. Yeah, see, I also have one of these too, Mike. Um, Twitter. I decided to Twitter because everything that pops up in my head is fascinating. I don't have time to write entire sentences, so I'll just send out one word per day, riboflavin. So Twitter is a whole, you know, a whole other monster. I'm just going to give you a few tips on that. In general, see if it's where you want to be. See if, you, if you're going to get the most bang for your buck. If your community's there, if you want to tell a story through Twitter, there's a lot of ideas. Um, I, I kind of say start slow. You know, kind of put your feet in the water. See, oh, this makes sense. Whether it's a blog or Facebook or so forth. If that's working for you, then keep adding different vehicles that support your marketing plan. Um, you can use Twitter more for niche marketing. There's uh, co something called uh, Twello or Twello Hood, which allows you to link your Twitter account and search by zip code. So if you are a charity that's local and you're just targeting like Hamden County or Gloucester County, you can see who's there on Twitter and if you want to start that engagement or not. Um, this is just an example of Red Cross for how they use Twitter. Again, American Red Cross, their bio. They have over 25,000 people following um, they follow, and they have over 350,000 people of, who are followers. So they, they really use it more of a news update. You know, they say what's there's going on. And because the Red Cross is so much, they constantly pretty much can tweet. Um, looks about every 10 to 20 minutes they send out a tweet. Uh, let me see for the other one. YouTube, again, we talked a little bit uh, about that. You should definitely consider adding that to your social media portfolio. It's, very, it's great because it's viral. Um, it's, it's cheap if, if you're doing it yourself. If not, it's still more effective. Um, it can, you can pull poor, poor performers if it's not working, and you can definitely tie it in across your platform. And the last area, of course, LinkedIn, which, of course, most of you were involved in that. It's great for prospect, prospecting and networking. There's lots of forums of information, groups that you can join, you know, help cross-promote. You can kind of establish relationships there if you're most comfortable, and then find out if they have a further social media profile like Facebook or Twitter and then start asking about maybe cross-promoting. Recommendations, of course, you can recommend um, others. They can recommend you. And then it is a great way to establish a kind of a name for your company. They have a company page, which I'm assuming probably most of you have established, um, and kind of a build a profile through LinkedIn. And lastly, the social media etiquette. Make sure that you don't have someone as a keyboard gangster you know, who takes over your wall or someone who's increasingly negative. Take control of it. You know, either talk with them. I say take fights offline. If there's a problem going on, delete the information. Contact that person personally, you know, the old-fashioned way, phone call, and you know, try to see what the issue is. Worst comes to worst, there's always stalkers. There's always people that you know, come out of the blue, and you can block them. You can, you can do things to kind of protect yourself. So you want to make sure that you keep all of your social media updated. Check it out constantly. It should never be outdated. You're going to lose interest, and you should never lose control of what's happening. And my final advice would be, of course, to build slowly. Um, if, you're, if you're already up and running, start looking at different vehicles that fit your marketing plan. How else could it help us tell a story, communicate, raise money, promote our cause? Um, don't be afraid to outsource if you are you know, really good in one way, but 
you need help, you know, do podcasting with Steve. Just some area that you're that you don't have. Um, don't have in your vehicle, then you, you should don't be afraid to outsource. Make sure they integrate and strengthen your marketing plan. That's the whole point of social media. It should be it should strengthen it, and it should be a part of integration. Make sure that you tell a really compelling story to keep your your base interested. And then, lastly, make sure you establish policy and guidelines. Really important. Really important. And then just my contact information. And then I hand it over to Howard. really important. Before I do anything, you all, everybody right now, group activity. What I want you to do is lean on the table in front of you, push the chair out. All right, we're pushing the chairs out, we're pushing the chairs out, and we're standing. We're standing now. Take a stand. Now, what I want you to do is with both your right and left hands, so that you don't have to know which one is which, Reach to the sky as high as you can, and there's $20 underneath the ceiling tile, <laughs> which I want you to try to go and grab. Um, the next thing I want you to do, I learned from my days as working with uh, orchestras, I want you to start with the lowest note you possibly can, and then just go up, so it's like, oh, can you keep going? Oh. That's how my kids love me. <laughs> So, so I want to start by telling you a little story. My child, when she turned five, she bought the Little Mermaid, or realistically, I bought the Little Mermaid, she twisted my arm. And what was really interesting was, about two weeks after she had gotten it and watched it about 50 times, she predicted the future of advertising, marketing, and how the internet works. And what she did was, she's casually watching TV one day, and sure enough, a commercial comes on for the Little Mermaid. And she, with her little beautiful blue innocent eyes, looks at me and says the following, Dad, we already have that one. Don't they know we already have it? Why are they showing us the commercial again? And I went, oh my god, you are so incredibly right. So I'm going to give you a little context. The only way to really understand the future, in my opinion, is to really understand the past. Well, this is Moore's Law. Has anyone ever heard of what Moore's Law is? other than Steve and a couple of people here. Here's the basic concept. It's a trend in computer hardware in which every two years, the number of transistors that can fit on a microprocessor processor is going to double. So that means over time going from about 4,000 transistors to many, many millions. And the thing about Moore's law is that it has applied not just in microprocessors, but in everything with technology. This means the cost of microprocessors has also done the exact same thing, except it's dropped in half every two years. The pixel density of digital cameras, the speed of the networks that we connect to, both wired and wireless, how we store things on hard drives or flash drives, and the cost of that storage, all of these things are following Moore's law almost to a T. I kind of look at the smallness of electronics, how what used to be this like room-sized computer my phone is now like way more powerful than. In fact, most people's phones in here are way more powerful than the $40,000 computer that my dad bought in the mid-70s. Um, the next innovation for this, I think, is going to be things like battery life, or more realistically, portable power. So how are cars and things like that. And there are a whole number of futurists who talk about these things coming together in what's called the singularity, which we won't go into because I'm not that crazy. Um, all that it really means is beware of our robot overlords, because they are coming to get us. So <clears throat> what do I think is in my crystal ball? What are the things that I'm really thinking about? Because often clients will talk to me and they'll say, Howard, what are you looking at over the next couple of years? Because I remember a couple, it was like you know, mid-2005, early 2006, and some clients were saying to me, what do you think is on the horizon? And I said, you know, you really should be looking at Facebook. It's not commercial yet, but when it goes commercial, it's going to be important. And they were like, eh, it's just where kids are. Six billion people later, or six million people, 600 million people later, it's a little bit different. So yes, new tools are cropping up every single day, and it is almost impossible to keep up with it. And I'm in the business, and I try a bit to keep up with it, and even I look at it and go, that's ah, just another one of those things. So what am I looking at? Well, let me give you some context. 1969, ARPANET. This was when two scientists started connecting computers together to send text to each other. 
But the concept of the ARPANET was, if a city blows up, we can still get the message from one city to another. We can basically take a nuclear missile attack. The concept is this, information will flow through new channels no matter what you do at any point on the network. This is a big theme in how things are moving. Now I think a little forward to 1977, when we started putting a PC modem inside of a computer. And what did that do? Well, a year later, now that we started seeing these modems in computers, people started creating bulletin board systems. So in 1978, we got the BBS used in a Chicago blizzard. So people in Chicago could communicate with each other and help mobilize forces using modems stuck in computers. 1979, we started organizing information on the internet, it's not that new, um, in what was called Usenet, which was, and I'll read the description and try to focus on this, the Usenet was a internet-based discussion system which organized topics into categories in public, right, in public, that people could post to, messages, all kinds of different threaded discussions in public, public. 1980, if you're in the media, and in 1980 when um, CNN started broadcasting, this should have been a big sign that things were going to change that the daily news cycle became the per minute news cycle. So there was also this thing that this guy, his name was Tim Berners-Lee, he came up with a proposal for hypertext. We'll get to that a little bit later. 1982, this was very significant in my life because this is when we started using the emoticon. Because in text, there's no context. There's no tone of voice. There's no little things like that. So 1982 was a big deal. 1985, we started registering domain names. So that instead of having to address a computer from one number to the next, we could register a domain name and type in, we want to go to IBM.com or Symbolics.com, which was the first domain name. There was also this community called The Well. And Well stood for Whole Earth Electronic Link. And the concept behind The Well, and brace yourselves for this, was a community of writers and readers sharing stories writing new articles and commenting on other people's articles in public, not anonymously, for the whole planet to participate in. And Wired Magazine basically said this is the most influential online community in the world. Um, moving forward a little bit, in 1988, we had this system called Internet Relay Chat, which was a real-time instant messaging service for chat, text-based. So, Real time, people showing up, talking in public. There's a theme today. 1991, we got the first web page, which, funny enough, was about a web page. I always thought that was very recursive. Um, we also got this thing called Gopher Search. Anybody here know what Gopher Search is? If you're involved with a library, you probably know what Gopher Search is. Yes? Here's the concept behind Gopher Search. Instead of just examining the titles of files, you actually look at the content inside. So you could type into a text box, imagine that, and look for content across different networks, whether it's different libraries or universities or research institutions, wherever it was across the internet, we could search inside the content of, that, uh, of those documents. We also got the first webcam. And this was great because it was focused on a coffee machine in the Cambridge Computer Science uh, Lab so that every minute a new picture of that coffee machine was uploaded to the web. So you could tell, oh, it looks like there's coffee ready to go. Um, <laughs> it actually ran until about 1998, so about seven years of continuous every minute new picture, um, long before Jenny Cam. Um, different Jenny. Thank you. Just checking. 1995, we saw commercialization of the internet. So after we got graphical browsers, we introduced secure communications so we could send credit card information over the web, and that launched things like eBay and Amazon. And a lot of times people look at Amazon and they go, wow, they're selling books. And the big thing about Amazon was yes, they started with books, but what they do is they know what you like. So their whole economy is based on, we think people who bought this will also like this. So we're gonna show that to you. So email from Amazon, is very different for everybody here. If you get email from Amazon, I guarantee you, none of it is the same that I get. 
And man, do I have to take those romance novels off my... My wife is on the same account with the Kindle thing, and she's like, Romance Novel City. And I have to keep saying, don't use these in my recommendations, because it is steamy sometimes what my email comes through. <laughs> 1998, we saw the launch of Google. And the side point about this, um, my father's PhD dissertation was on database structures and relational systems. And um, Larry and Sergey quoted his dissertation to say, this is how we've designed how Google indexes a lot of its content. And for that, he receives a royalty of as much as I'm getting paid to be here today. So, yay, Google. Um, 2000, we had sort of a problem. A lot of people had very bad business ideas, but they had a website, so they thought they could get funding. And they did, and then it stopped working. But the thing that happened from the year 2000 to the year 2001 was we saw the first time a community created something so big and so powerful that it basically made Encyclopedia Britannica irrelevant, and that was the creation of Wikipedia. So what took Encyclopedia Britannica over 100 years and paid people lots of money, tons and tons of money, Wikipedia did in 18 months for almost no money. And Wikipedia is so much better and so much better curated, because instead of it being curated by one or two people on a particular subject, it's being curated by thousands of people, all adding to individual pages, making it a little better, adding resources. So I'm going to skip all the stuff from in recent history because we know what that stuff is. But when I try to think what's next in the future, well, there's a lot of different things. One of the things that we've all learned a little bit about this morning is the ability to self-publish, the ability to broadcast for yourself, the ability to tweet or post on Facebook or create a blog. These tools are things that are all for you and you should be using and thinking about. But that's just getting us moving forward. There are more things in terms of the cloud and different services integrating, and that's kind of a lot of fun. But a broad understanding of all these technologies and how they combine to create new ways of looking at data, people, ideas is very important. So what I want to talk to you about is how do I get more knowledge of my customer or more knowledge of getting myself into the center of the map. So I remember going to... Um, when I was looking at colleges, my dad and I went to AAA and we mapped out our route around the country where we were driving to. And they went back to the, to the side and they got out the little triptych maps. Do any of you know these things? The little spiral bound things, the little page by. Can you imagine today going to AAA and asking for a triptych map? No. We, for now, if we want to travel somewhere, we decide we're at the center of the map. So, for example, when I jump in my little car GPS, what does it do? It basically says, you're right here, and the map rotates all around me. Wherever I drive, I'm always at the center of the map. Well, that is going to happen across all different services. Everything from location services and check-in. Things like Brightkite, uh, Foursquare, Gowalla. Uh, there's a new one called Scavenger, which is uh, starting to get a little bit of popularity. The idea of adding some kind of game mechanic to telling the story of I'm right here now. How many of you checked in this morning, other than me and Jen? Anyone else check in on Foursquare? Or Facebook or something? I couldn't get a... You couldn't get a lock. I know, it's the metal shielding that I put up whenever I speak. Um, Facebook Places, it's another huge thing. If your organization depends on people showing up somewhere, that kind of let's all be here together, sort of a community event, is wildly important, and important for businesses and organizations to really know their customers and to connect with them. There's a lot of local deal-a-day types of things. Things like Groupon and Living Social, and there's Philly Dealio. There's lots of little clones. But the idea is, I'm living right here, therefore, the information that's important to me is showing up around me. And it's different for my in-laws in California and my sister in Boston and my uncle in Israel. All right, next thing I want to talk about is um, post-PC era. This is, when I think about mobile technology, and I think about, you know, lots of people have said mobile technology is going to surpass desktop usage within five years, and um, the sales have actually already passed. So mobile devices, things like iPhones, iPads, Android devices, have already passed desktop PC sales. But what's really important is it's not just mobile, it's not just tablet. It's understanding that the way we fundamentally use technology, we have been it's very similar to what's, what uh, Steve Jobs talked about as an agrarian nation, where he decided that uh, in a speech last year to, uh, to the D8 conference, 
he said PCs are like trucks, right? PCs are like trucks. And um, when we were an agrarian nation, all cars were trucks. We needed trucks to move stuff from one place to another because that's what we needed on farms. But now we all have little tiny cars that are very gas efficient and we don't drive a lot of trucks. They still exist, people still use them, but not everybody needs a truck. And so mobile technology or the tablet or these different smaller computers, computers that don't look like a traditional, I'm gonna sit at the desktop and do something. You're just going to work with technology and not think, man, I'm sitting at my computer doing technology. That's what's gonna happen. So a lot of these devices are gonna stop feeling like computers, you're just gonna use it in a way that's much more productive. The next thing that's very important are what I like to refer to as the social signals. We on Facebook call them likes or dig if you were into that in 2004. Um, Google's adding a new feature to its search called plus one, where you could literally, you look at a search result and you can click a little plus one by it. This is in beta, so only a few people are seeing at this point. Uh, Twitter has a retweet. But the idea is the community, people, us, we are making some kind of sign to the planet that says this is important. So we take all of the search engine optimization where we're actually indexing the content that is human readable and good to look at and not uh, like what uh, JCPenney un unwittingly did, which um, if you ever want to know all the details of the tech of that hack, oh, it was brilliant, but uh, I could go on about that, t that, that tech. The idea is our social graph, how we connect with people and what they like influences what we're gonna see. Um, a simple thing, if anyone has ever seen on an iPad an application called Flipboard, well, what Flipboard does is it presents the news based on what all of your friends or Twitter followers are sharing. So instead of going to CNN.com and saying, what are the headlines? You're getting links from the New York Times, CNN, Al Jazeera, my friend. Like You're getting links from everywhere that are important that people care about. And they just get presented in a single stream. So imagine all of that RSS that we talked about earlier that Steve referred to. Imagine that RSS becomes, from all different directions, your community's curating it. So the news shows up to you, what's important to you. Again, the social signals put you at the center of your map. Uh, the next thing that I like to talk about is, um, and I like to call it the world of perfectly organized information. This is Google's goal, which is to take our series of tubes, to take the internet and get all of its content discovered so that we can really put all of that together in really new and interesting ways but what they do every single day is they fundamentally believe that having this content organized so that everybody can access it as quickly as possible and as humanly as possible, that this is gonna create a better planet. By getting the middlemen out of the way, by getting the people that stop the flow of this information, remember the internet where if you hit a bomb in the middle, the information will still flow. By keeping that information flowing, we can change things so that people actually have some uh, some power. Uh, talk to the people in Egypt and Libya and other places in the Middle East that are experiencing some of that and uh, they'll let you know how powerful the internet is because even when the governments tried to shut it off, it didn't work. They still were able to use other ways, other parts of the internet to get their message apart. Uh, Facebook's a little bit different direction. They're not just indexing the content that is out there, they're indexing the people. So our actions, our activities, what we like, they're bringing that together to say, well, if we do things and say, for example, I like Rowan University, if I say I like that, well, that shows up to my friends as, well, that must be important because Howard likes it. Now, if a lot of people like it, then it's even more important. But the idea is that in the world in which I step up and say, I think this is important, I have to be accountable for my actions. So if I step up and say Victoria's Secret is important, well, people might say, well, he likes Victoria's Secret. Well, fancy that. If I get up there and I say this particular political party is important, well, all of a sudden there might be another group of people who say, hmm, we don't like him anymore because he's on the other side from us. And there is always an other side from you. But what's important to know is being accountable for those things is now something that is part of our lives, whether you like it or not. Um, when I went to college, nobody walked around with flip cams and camera phones, which meant that when my friend Alex got drunk and practically fell down the stairs every other night, that today he's a very well-respected university professor. 
because he is, he's a smart guy. But he was in college and he didn't have to be accountable for, I'm gonna take a picture of you chalk line outline because you're so... So when I think about uh, what governments are dealing with, governments are trying to go very data enabled. Think about the election in 2008. If you had, three weeks before everybody voted, taken the number of fans and followers, likes, retweets, and put them together in a database, and used that to predict the election, it would have been within a tenth of a percent, not just for the president, but for every national election, local election, everywhere across the country within a tenth of a percent. So, um, if you don't think this stuff is kind of pervading society, um, the numbers for Facebook were running out of adults. Like the number of people in this country who use Facebook, we are running out of adults. So the growth is slowing in this country because we can't be born that fast. The next thing that I'm looking at is a concept called radical transparency. And what this really means, and I like to boil it down to a very simple phrase, and you all are, or almost all of you, are very lucky in here. If your customer, and I say this because this affects uh, nonprofits, not less, but still affects you. If your customer or follower or friend knew how your business or organization earned profit, would they still do business with you? If they knew how you made money, how the wheels turned, would they still like you? Because here's what's gonna happen in this world of perfectly organized information. They're gonna find out. And you can't hide it. Sorry. That's my be scared of this moment. They're going to find out. So if you run your business or organization in a way that people wouldn't be proud of being a part of, that is the challenge. Fix that part. It's big, it's hard, but the internet's gonna force you to do it in a very powerful way. The information's flowing freely. We're getting middlemen out of the way. If your industry is based on controlling the flow of that information, stopping it, keeping people in the dark, you will be eliminated. Sorry. I have some friends who are in those industries and it's going to be very painful. And I've warned them for 10 years or so about this disintermediation that I like to talk about. And they keep saying, no, 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 no. But talk to all the mortgage people who are now in the internet social media guru business. Talk to them about what it was like six years ago when they couldn't sell mortgages fast enough. And now you actually have to like be a good mortgage person. It's a very different industry. I'll let you know what's next. This is a problem that I see, is that people try to opt out. And they will say, I don't want to be part of this. I don't think that being on Facebook is, is going to be relevant for me or for my business. And that's fine. You're welcome to opt out. And it will look a lot like this, because your community is there. So whatever stats and wherever the growth is, people are there. They're there every single day. They spend their lives there. They connect with their friends there. They care about things there. And there is a place that isn't Facebook, it isn't Google, it isn't the internet. It is a connected world. It's using technology to communicate with other humans. I like to communicate with other humans. I think about how I use a telephone. I pick up the phone and I talk on it and then I'm done with the phone conversation. Then I look at video conferencing, and I do effectively the same thing. I turn on the video conferencing, I talk to someone, it's a little awkward because we're looking at each other, and it's like, eh, and, and then we sit it down. And then I think about how my daughter, who's now nine, works with Skype. She, be, she, she doesn't just talk with her friend. She is with her friend. She is, in, she is being with her friend. That means they will sit together and color together, and there's this window between them where they'll set the laptop up, and they'll just be on the floor coloring things, playing things. They're being together. Her friend's in Texas, she's in New Jersey. And they're together. So when they're on Skype, and sometimes for like 10 minutes they won't talk, they'll just be coloring or doing whatever. I'll come in and I'll say, oh, are you guys done? And she goes, no, we're still playing. I can't conceive of it. So as much as I'm a digital native, someone who's been programming since he was four, I see how she relates to video conferencing, and I know it's a world that technology is being used to connect us. And that's human. That's not iPhone. That's not Unix. That's not the internet. That's human connections. 
So what's important for you all to understand is the concept of a digital referral. And I'm going to get this very, very practical. Because when I shout to the internet, pay attention to me, most people go, yeah, 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 I'm busy. But when someone else says, pay attention to that, you go, hmm, what's that about? You're all nonprofits. Digital referrals are important. You can't shout loud enough. You don't have enough money. You need your community to shout for you. So think about simple things that you can do. Think about everything from getting people who like you to retweet or to post about you or share links. Think about how you can partner with an organization and do email marketing together. Think about just being involved on Twitter and replying to conversations about everything that you do. Think about how those things can work together. And then think about this concept I like to call intentional serendipity. And um, there's a really great formula. What you do is you take all the different networks and you throw them in a blender, and you take the number of people using the networks and you throw that into the blender too. You think about the amount of time people spend on any given network. You think about the length of, uh, or the staleness or the activity. You know, is something news or is it knowledge? You throw it all in and somewhere between invisible and annoying, you know intuitively how many times you should post, how often you should tweet, what a conversation looks like. But the idea is that if you show up like the way you would want to be showed up to, that's probably right. So some people will say, well, should I be tweeting every hour? I don't know. For some people, that's great. For other people, it's too much. It should be appropriate. Should I be posting on Facebook a status every two hours, three hours, five times a day, five times a week? It's different. It depends on your community. If you get a lot of people responding and you post every hour, keep doing it. If you post once a day and you get a lot of responses, that sounds about right. Somewhere between invisible and annoying is a balance. So let me give you a little bit of, you're going to go home and try stuff. So here's sort of a fancy way of saying, when you try stuff, don't screw it up on your first day. So the first thing is, if you are blogging, do not write War and Peace on day one. The epic post that is all about everything is very difficult to write, and nobody's paying attention yet. So it's kind of like hard. So don't write that first. Work on a whole collection of different small ideas. Get good at it. Feel comfortable with it. And then start working in the big stuff, because people will have already shown up, and you'll be better at it. The second thing to think about is, if you do email marketing, this is not a postcard. When you get a postcard in the mail, there is something very different about holding a little piece of paper and walking through and going, oh, here's this postcard. And if you like it and you decide to recycle it, you're not mad at the person who sent it to you. With email, this phone is on my nightstand when I sleep. When you send me an email at 6 a.m. because you think I'll get it first thing in the morning, I am angry at you. You've invaded my personal space with something that I was not expecting. It might be irrelevant because it didn't say, Dear Howard, it said, Dear Friend. And it might not actually be for something that I signed up for. You've just annoyed me. So now I hate you in a small way. You add those small hates up, and you get why people get so frustrated with email marketing that we call them blasts. How many people here call them when they do their email marketing campaign? You say, we're going to send out an email marketing blast. Honestly, how many people call them blasts? Be honest. No, 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 really, be honest, right? Email blast equals digital shrapnel. When it goes off, we duck. Remember that there are people on the other end. Um, this is important. Don't post anything irrelevant. So if your organization has a particular mission and you start posting about something totally irrelevant to your organization, I just don't get it. I see people retweeting Mashable links. Stuff that I read about social networks. And their organization is using a social network, not promoting the use of social network or understanding the, the use of social networks. So they post all these Mashable links. I'm like, what are you doing? You sell gourmet pet food. And you're posting social media links from Mashable? You've got to be out of your mind. You're teaching your audience how to ignore you. And attention is precious. Our time is precious. It's actually the one scarce asset in a digital world. Next, and this is, and Jen just said outsource. And what she's talking about is getting people who are qualified to speak for you. Do not outsource your voice to people who are unqualified. It's a very important distinction. That means the nephew who is tweeting for you is a bad choice. But a PR company who is trained to speak on your behalf is a great choice. But be in collaboration with them. Because if they start going in a direction 
and that doesn't feel right for you, then know that. There are tools that allow you to work on these networks together collaboratively. So you can be monitoring the same things. Let them post and let you be the one who responds. So you're working in the same dashboard together. Um, this is important because people get crazed over this. It doesn't matter how many followers, fans, likes, retweets you get because someone will have more. It's more important the people who do it. So if someone retweets a post on Twitter, acknowledge it in some small way. Let them know that you thank them for it because they might retweet you again at another point. And if you see that they're doing something interesting that's relevant to your audience, retweet it. Do that like referral thing. Next, don't be a broken record. So if you have this one link that you like to tweet all the time, don't keep tweeting it. Just don't keep posting it. Don't keep sharing it. Don't be a broken record. It teaches us to ignore you. Um, don't automate. I will say that because most of what most of the automation tools do is they literally do a fancy cut and paste. If you take a post that shows up on Facebook and you automatically have it post to Twitter and to LinkedIn and to all these different places all at once, what you're basically saying to all of the different constituencies is we don't care. The audience on Facebook and LinkedIn are different. They use different language. They use different words and they're there at different times. So don't talk to people on Twitter the way you would talk to them on Facebook, the way you would talk on LinkedIn. On Twitter, I do smack talk about the NBA. Why? Because that's what I use. I like to talk with people like I'm at the game. Like if you've ever been to a baseball game or a basketball game, there's people around you and you talk. Well, if I'm stuck on my couch because my kids are asleep and I can't afford the $300 to go for one night of a basketball game, I'll do it on Twitter and we'll smack talk. And there are Celtics fans who know what it's like to be next to me on Twitter during an NBA game. If you like to read news, let's say for example you read the New York Times and they have that little share button because you like it, please don't overwhelm us. Don't share 20 articles a day from the New York Times. That's their job, not yours. Your job is to pick the one article that's most important to the people you care about. Also, don't always be the center of attention. Let other people be the center. Lift them up. Say, this person over here, this organization, they're doing something really interesting that I care about. And you should too. Because when you're always the center of attention, people will learn to say, he's always the center of attention, we can ignore him. Next, use a timer. Get like a kitchen timer, or I have a little clock on my computer that says like 10 minutes has expired. Set it before you start. And when it goes off, don't change it back. Because we do not want to have the Twitter hangover or the Facebook lost weekend. Seriously, if it's 3 a.m. and you're on Twitter, you should be sleeping. If it's 3 a.m. and you're on Twitter, you should be sleeping. If it's 4 a.m. and you're on Facebook, you didn't get up that early. It's too late. Set a timer. And finally, remember that you're human people. Like, you're going to screw something up. Someone's going to say something mean. And maybe, just maybe, someone else will say, geez, they just made it messed up. Don't troll them. Don't keyboard gangster them to death, as Jen likes to call it. You will make mistakes. And that reminds me of a little story about Barbara Streisand. This is her private estate. This is the very thing that she didn't want anybody to see. So I share it with you today. Because here's what happened. This little nonprofit in California got some small amount of funds to take aerial shots from the coast of the entire California coastline so they could sew it together in this beautiful panorama. Well, she was like, you're not allowed to take a picture of my home. So they, she went and made a huge stink about this. And the, and the organization was like, fine, fine, we'll take it off. And here's how the response worked. Thousands of people reposted that picture to their own websites. And you can now Google the term Streisand effect and learn all about the effect that is the one thing you're trying to hide will, like squeezing dough in your fingers, it squishes out everywhere. You can't control it. You can't squish that information. It will seep out in other directions. So what does this mean for us? We have some work to do. It means with all of these tools, we have to start making some really great digital stuff. So what used to look like a press release is now a blog entry. 
What used to look like a customer testimonial should now be a video on YouTube. An event like this, or if you're doing something special, get video coverage, get audio coverage, talk to people, get voices, pictures, get people in the message. Let us taste it. Even better, let us share it and move it forward. But it's really way beyond the businesses. It's these social signals that are turning into something even better. It's a planet that I, get, I can't wait to live on, in which something that, when you screw something up, the community will forgive you. And when your community comes to your rescue because some troll shows up at your front door saying, these guys did X, Y, and Z, and the hundreds or thousands of people who like you on Facebook or follow you on Twitter come to your rescue and say, you know what, that's not how they do business. That must have been some mistake or an employee, and this is how they're fixing it. When they come to your rescue, there's no PR problem. It's just extra worthy attention for your business. So these are the four words to embrace. Operate openly and listen carefully. The internet's a huge listening device. All of this data is being captured. By figuring out how you can get information out of it that's relevant to you, and by restructuring how your organization works so that if people knew the innards of it, they'd still love you. These are wildly, wildly important. So now I'm done. I think at this point we're going to do sort of like open questions for us. Yeah? No? For more information about the Nonprofit Development Center of Southern New Jersey, visit www.npdcsnj.org. We produce this program in the studios of Professional Podcasts in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. For everyone at the Nonprofit Development Center of Southern New Jersey, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for joining us, and take good care. <laughs>